Hello, this is Wayland Chow, and welcome to Torts, Introduction, and Intentional Torts, Module 4A, Part B. In this part, we'll finish our introduction to torts by looking at vicarious liability, remedies, and liability insurance. Who is liable for a tort? The most obvious person is the person who actually committed the tort, or in other words, the tort, the tort feeser. Another person could be the tort feeser's employer if the tort was committed in the course of in the course of employment. That first type of liability, the liability against the person who committed the tort, we call that personal or direct liability. Liability of the employer for a tort committed by an employee is called vicarious liability. The victim of a tort can sue both the employee who committed the tort and the the employer of that of that employee. So again, the employees being the, 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 the person who committed the tort would be directly liable. And the employer may be either vicariously liable for the employee's tort committed in the course of employment. And the employer could also be directly liable if it committed its own its own tort. So for example, if they were careless in training uh, the the employee who, who 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 committed the tort, if they weren't properly trained, and that's why the the employee uh, committed the tort, and they were careless or caused damage to to the to the customer, then because of that careless training, the employer could be directly directly liable. So we know that an employer can be held vicariously liable for a tort committed by an employee as long as it was committed in the course of employment. So what is actually meant by course of employment? That's what the Supreme Court of Canada looked at in the case of Basley and Curry. So the facts of this case involve an employer called the Children's Foundation, which ran two residential care facilities for the treatment of emotionally troubled children between the ages of 6 and 12. The, the foundation's employees were, were authorized to act as parent figures for, for the children uh, in, their, in their care. Uh, the, the employees were to do everything a parent would do from just general supervision to even think, intimate things like you know, bathing and tucking in at bedtime. The, the foundation hired a specific employee named Mr. Curry who happened to be, to be a pedophile. But the foundation didn't know he was a pedophile. They had checked him out, checked his references, and he seemed, you know, and they and they were all they were all clear. Um, but the unfortunate thing that happened is that when Mr. Curry was working at the foundation, helping to take care of children, one of the children in his care, uh, he he sexually he sexually abused. Um, when the foundation found out, uh, you know, what what had happened. They immediately, you know, fired uh, fired Curry and Curry and found out that he had actually been convicted convicted ni of 19 counts of sexual abuse in the past. And 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 the the victim, uh, the the child who was abused, you know, Basley has has sued the foundation for compensation for the injuries that he suffered because of that sexual abuse. The the foundation you know, took the position that it had done nothing wrong. Uh, it had. You know, done its due diligence in hiring ba in hiring Basley. They they checked his references, and they also supervised him in, in an appropriate way. Uh, but Basley's uh, position was that it doesn't matter if the foundation uh, did did its due diligence or or did nothing wrong. The the foundation is still nonetheless uh, liable uh, as as the employer by way of vicarious liability for the tort committed by by its employee Curry. So the, the legal issue uh, in this case is whether or not the foundation, the employer, is vicariously liable for its employee's sexual as assault of a child in its care. So the court had to, uh, you know, had to determine what you know, what is the applicable law for de determining vicarious liability, 
And, and it's said that you know, there are two ways that an employer can be held vicariously liable. The first way is when the, the employee has done something that is authorized by the, by the employer, which in this case, obviously, the, the, the foundation did not authorize Curry to sexually abuse this child. So that's, you know, that doesn't apply to this case, but that's, that's, that's one way that an employer can be held vicariously liable. The other way, the second way, is, you know, is where the, the employee has done something that's unauthorized, that's not allowed by the employer, but, but what they did that was unauthorized is significantly connected to the employment duties of that employee. So if there, as long as there's that significant connection between you know what happened between the bad thing that happened and the 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 employment duties, the job, the authorized duties of that employee, then the employer can be held vicariously liable. So the court you know looked in detail at the facts of of this case. Um, and there's an excerpt here which I'm, I'm showing you, but I won't I won't read through it. Uh, but they, they basically uh, come to the conclusion by after by looking through these these facts that there was a significant connection between the the sexual abuse committed by Curry and and his employment duties. It was his employment duties that 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 required him to come into intimate contact with the kids at at this institution and that and that those employment duties gave him the opportunity to sexually abuse the victim here so to sum up the the test the legal test that comes from basley and curry for vicarious liability so an employer is vicariously liable for tort if either number one uh, the uh, the employee's wrongful act was actually authorized by the company or the employee's wrongful act was significantly connected to the employee's employment. Please take a moment to read through this quick quiz question by pausing this video at this time. So read through it and, and, and choose what you think is the correct answer. The answer to this question is D, any or all of the above. So A, B, and C are, are true statements. A says Brad and Angie uh, personally liable for their, for their negligence. So Brad and Angie are the ones who committed the tort. So they can be held directly or personally liable. Uh, B says Gold Star liable for its uh, negligence in hiring incompetent staff. So Gold Star could be held directly liable for that negligence because they're the ones who who were who were incompetent in or were, were negligent in hiring incompetent staff. The the third the third choice is a Gold Star vicariously is vicariously liable for Brad and Angie's negligence. So Brad and Angie uh, chose very bad investments for for the clients. Obviously, uh, that wasn't authorized by the employer, Gold Star. Gold Star, you know, you, Gold Star would never, or any, any investment firm would, would almost never tell its investment advisors, you know, to you are authorized to pick inappropriate or bad investments for your clients. So that's, so it, it's, it wasn't authorized, but even though it wasn't authorized, uh, it, they, were, they were picking those investments uh, as a part of their job uh, with Gold Star, so there was a significant connection uh, with uh, with their job, and you know, based on the test from Basley and Curry, uh, Gold Star would be vicariously liable. So that's why the answer is D. Any or all of the above. Let's now talk about remedies. If you sue in tort and win, a court may give you. You know, one of four different remedies, compensatory damages, punitive damages, nominal damages, and injunction. The first type of remedy is compensatory damages. This is where the court orders the defendant to pay money to the plaintiff 
for the purpose of compensating for the losses or injuries that the plaintiff has suffered from the tort. There are three legal tests that need to be applied to determine compensatory damages. The first is that the amount of damages should be the amount that puts the plaintiff back in the same financial position as if the tort had not occurred. The second, the second test that we apply is called the doctrine of remoteness. So this limits the ability to claim losses to only those losses that can be reasonably foreseen as a consequence of the tort. So if a loss is not a reasonable, reasonably foreseeable consequence of the tort, then that loss is not allowed. This, this limitation, this doctrine of remoteness, however, does not apply to intentional torts. It does apply to negligence torts. The third test that we apply is the doctrine of mitigation. Doctrine of mitigation says that you know, the plaintiff, you know, the person who has suffered a loss, has a duty to take, to take reasonable steps to minimize the losses arising from the tort. And if the plaintiff does not take those reasonable steps to minimize, then the damages that they're entitled to are reduced. The second type of damages is punitive damages. We've heard about punitive damages before, back in Module 3C, when we talked about remedies arising from a breach of contract. This is the exact same concept here, except in the context of damages arising from a tort. So the rules are the same. The purpose of punitive damages is to punish the defendant for harsh, vindictive, reprehensible, or malicious behavior. So this is really extra bad behavior, go, which, which is much worse than just meeting the minimal requirements of, of the tort that was committed. So punitive damages are not awarded that often in Canadian courts. It's much more common in, in U.S. courts. The leading case on punitive damages, which we discussed in detail in Module 3C, is, is the Supreme Court decision in Witten and Pilot Insurance. So you should go back and have a look at Module 3C to, uh, to refresh in your memory on, on what, that, what that case is about and what the, what the legal principles are regarding punitive damages. The third type of remedy is nominal damages. So this is, this is where you sue because someone has committed a tort against you and, and, and let's say you win. Uh, but, but the court says, well, you, win, you won because you, you've proven that, that the other person committed the tort, but you didn't really suffer any damages. You didn't really suffer any loss because of, because of the tort. So you win, but you, you get no damages. You, get, you don't get anything out of, out of the lawsuit, in other words. Um, so, so you have that feeling of victory of, for maybe a few, few seconds, at, at least until, until, you get, uh, until you get your legal bill in the mail, and then, you, then that feeling of victory disappears really quickly. The, the fourth type of remedy is an injunction, which we, we had also talked about uh, in module, uh, module 3D uh, for, for breaches of contract. So this is where a court orders a defendant to either do something or refrain from doing something. Uh, one, one example is a story of the, uh, the Sriracha hot sauce factory in California. Some of the people who lived around that factory were complaining about various odors coming out of that factory, these spicy smells that irritated them. So they, so the 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 town actually took the the factory owner to court and had the court, you know, order the factory to be at least partially partially shut down. So that was that was an injunction, the court ordering the factory to partially shut down. Most businesses operate under the risk of being sued in tort. To manage and to minimize that risk, many businesses will purchase liability insurance. Liability insurance, or an insurance policy, is a contract between an insurance company, which we will call the insurer, and a person or business, which we will call the insured. 
under that contract or policy, the insured agrees to pay premiums. So this is the this is the cost of purchasing the insurance. The insurer in exchange agrees to provide coverage under which the insurer will, number one, pay damages for tort liability on behalf of the insured. So if there is a successful lawsuit uh, imposing tort liability on the insured person, the insurance company will, will pay for those damages. But the amount they'll pay will be less an amount that we call a deductible. So the deductible is is relatively a smaller amount compared to the, the total liability, but that deductible amount is paid by the insured. The other thing that the insurer agrees or is obligated to do is to defend lawsuits against the insured. So if you are, let's say, an accountant who's being sued by a client for negligence, the the insurance company has an obligation to arrange for your for your legal defense in that lawsuit. They will hire a lawyer and pay for that lawyer as well. Now, most professionals, such as CPAs, lawyers, engineers, they are required by their governing body to have liability insurance. So CPAs uh, get their liability insurance from a program called the Chartered Professional Accountants Professional Liability Insurance Program.